so that's awesome. Uh, my name is Joshua Ogle. I'm actually originally from here, uh, so some of you guys I haven't seen in a while, but it's really awesome to be able to come back and see everybody again. Uh, so I'm a designer. I think I'm the only real design talk uh, this time, so thank you for coming. Um, next time maybe I'll give a, a technical talk, but I uh, glad at least somebody's interested in the design stuff. Uh, so I do mostly design. I do a lot of coding too, lots of JavaScript, uh, quite a bit of Ruby also, try to be as useful as possible. Uh, but what I really, really like is the hard to solve design problems, especially if those design problems happen to involve code, it's even better. Um, and that works out really well at ThoughtBot. If you guys are in the Ruby and Rails community, you've definitely heard of ThoughtBot. Uh, if you haven't, uh, we do lots of other stuff too, so there's more and more JavaScript stuff, Python, Haskell, Go. Um, we've got up to a little over 90 people now, I think, so a couple people are into all sorts of things. Uh, one really cool thing we get to do is on Fridays, uh, we get what we call an investment day, and that means that we get to contribute to open source, write blog posts, uh, do stuff in the community, things like that. So uh, the good part of that is you get to see lots of us, which is awesome. Uh, but also, years before starting at ThoughtBot, uh, I was using a lot of the open source tools and things like that, so I got to benefit from that directly. And then now I get to help out with that stuff too. So if you do any front end stuff with like Bourbon and Meet and some of the CSS frameworks, uh, that's our designers that work on that mostly. And uh, that's really nice too, to be able to get back like that. Uh, but ThoughtBot is a consulting company, uh, which means that if you don't work in Ruby and Rails, you probably haven't heard of us, but you have probably heard of the places that uh, we work for. Um, so some of that's places like Code Climate, uh, like the Realtor Association. There's some really big ones that we're working with right now that I'm not entirely sure I'm allowed to talk about, but they rhyme with Schmintel and Schmottbox. <laughs> Things that might be similar to that. Um, but mostly what we do, at least 95% of what we do is working with small startups, uh, places that you've never heard of, but we work with them to make sure they have a really solid foundation, something that they can put in front of investors maybe. A lot of them don't have funding yet and they're seeking funding. Uh, ones where they don't have their own development team yet, we can help them uh, hire their own people. Like we'll actually be in the hiring process and interview their people and make sure that they've got the people that they need to be able to take on this platform that we're building for them because a lot of times the, the uh, founders aren't technical founders. Um, so being able to make sure they have this really solid foundation. And uh, as a designer, selfishly a little bit, I also think that that's the most interesting stuff. Being able to solve lots of different kinds of problems I think gives you uh, some good insight in how just problems are solved generally. So one of the things that we have uh, developed is called the Product Design Sprint. Uh, originally, it started out at Google Ventures. Um, so how many people know maybe the design sprint from Google? Uh, one or two? Okay, good. Uh, the Google Ventures one is a slightly different uh, because uh, they do funding and things like that. They are still working with startups, but um, the design sprint that they do is slightly more business focused, uh, which is great. That means they're working on the, the business proposal and how do you talk to investors and things like that. Ours is much more technical. Um, that's our specialty. We don't. Uh, have people that focus on funding and things like that, but uh, everyone at ThoughtBot is a developer, and so that's really the kind of problems that we're trying to solve. So our design sprint is much more focused on uh, how does the product work, uh, who is it for, is it solving the right problems, making sure that we're not making too many assumptions and things like that. Uh, but what I really like about this process especially is that it's so open. So Google Venture started it, there's tons of information on there, and I'm gonna link to that later. Uh, ThoughtBot now is, and some other places are taking this on and doing their own little spin on it. All of that's very open to, and hopefully you guys get to do these, and uh, we'll give back to the community of that too, because uh, really this helps everybody. There's lots of problems out there to solve, and if we can do that in the best way possible, then that's great. Uh, but really it's, it's trying to solve this problem, that fanning products it doesn't have to be hard. It is hard, but it doesn't have to be. And the best way to approach that is just to Try to be as honest as you can. Um, I think a lot of times people come into a problem thinking that they know the solution. They've got this idea that's gonna, you know, that's gonna change the whole world and everybody's gonna fall in love with it, and that's not always the case. And maybe they do need to question things and, and really dig down deep into what it is they're trying to solve, and maybe they're what they're actually doing is something else entirely. Um, so a good example of maybe when things don't go right, um, I think was this. Uh, project called Facebook Home. Did anybody buy one of these phones or have this on their Android device? Okay, nobody. That's what kind of what I thought. Uh, I made a big splash a couple of years ago, and as a designer, I have to admit, it's gorgeous. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. Basically, the idea is that you would have Facebook on your home screen, and it really transformed your 
Android device uh, into a Facebook machine, which I mean is what a lot of people use it for anyway. But uh, it gives you this really nice home screen experience where people message you, you see it right there. Uh, it looks fantastic, but there's only one problem, and it's that uh, nobody was really asking for that. Um, <laughs> the nice thing about an Android phone, and uh, smartphones in general, is that they can do lots of things. And uh, I don't think too many people were asking Facebook to take over their phone. So uh, Facebook obviously spent a lot of time on this, and lots of money, and I'm sure lots of designers and developers were working on it. Um, if you look at the project now, because it is still up, it's on the, the Play Store, it hasn't been updated since, uh, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, it did not last long at all. It uh, hasn't had a single update since then, which is really sad, because it, it really is a, a pretty thing. It's just that it wasn't useful. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, those are difficult things to be able to tell apart. As uh, so John Gruber said, it's a well-designed implementation of an idea no one wants. And unfortunately, that happens a lot. Uh, you don't want to be the, the startup founder that spends you know, $100,000 on a product that nobody really wanted. And you could have been spending your time doing something that people really did want. Um, so here's another one. It says, uh, designing successful products means observing how real people solve problems, exploring the context of the situation they are in, and then understanding causality, anxieties, and motivations. And I think this is the key. This is what Facebook missed. Um, actually, I don't know that for sure. I don't know. Maybe they were talking to people that said, yes, Facebook, this is the best thing ever. I love you. Um, that's totally possible. <laughs> But if that's true, they weren't doing it in a very scientific way, uh, because obviously that's not how it turned out. So hopefully the solution to that, and I think it is, uh, is put it in front of real people, people that are not invested in the product, see how they use it, um, see what it is that they are wanting from it, and then you'll know what to build, because you shouldn't be building something to satisfy your own ego, you should be building it for them. And so there's this idea of renting before you buy. Um, so I thought about we, we use this uh, phrase in a couple of different ways. <laughs> Sorry, it's more dramatic this one. Uh, we use this idea in a couple of different ways. One, as a consulting company, uh, we are hoping that they're going to keep engaging us. Um, a lot of times it's, it's a shorter term thing, not because but they don't like us, they usually do really like us. We are kind of expensive, that's mostly the reason. Um, but we are getting them invested in the product uh, a little bit, but hopefully trying things out just a little also. Um, so they can see if they like us, see if we like them. Um, their product design sprint typically takes just a week. Um, and sometimes people aren't quite ready to spend that much money to uh, have a consulting company come in and completely tear their idea apart. And that's okay. It's a scary thing. Um, so this is kind of an, an idea. A way for us to uh, test each other out. But it's also a, a way for you to try out your own product. Um, at the end of the product design sprint, you should have a prototype that you can actually touch and play with. And so maybe it's this nebulous thing in your head so far, but at the end of this, it's actually something on the screen you can touch and, and work with how you hopefully are envisioning it. Um, and so you can try out this thing for your own, and, and you can get in front of real users that can do the same thing. Um, so as I say, it's a, it's a five-day process that we typically do. Um, it could be longer or shorter, but most of them are five days. Day one is understand. Uh, then day two, what we call diverge, and I'll explain what these are later. Day three, converge. Day four is prototyping, and then day five is all of that user testing. So it really doesn't give us a lot of time uh, to tear an idea apart. That's really only three days for that part uh, before we get into really trying to build this thing to see what it's all about. So we do want to have uh, really three types of people. It could be more than, uh, more than just three people. We need at least these three kinds of people in there. One's the facilitator. Uh, that's somebody who has done a product design sprint before. Um, so maybe they've you know, worked at a consulting place where they've done this a few times. Maybe they've had a product design sprint uh, where somebody else came in and ran it with them. That's fine. Now they can facilitate one of their own. Maybe they attended a lecture and they know all about it now. Uh, with you guys, you can go and do it on your own. Uh, the second one's a recorder. Um, they're really there because trying to facilitate one and record everything and take notes at the same time is really hard. I've done it before. It's super tough. You want a recorder there, but that's their job. And the third is the product owner. So in our case, it's someone who has hired ThoughtBot to come in and, and they want us to build something for them. Uh, if you work at a products company, that might mean like a manager, or maybe you have somebody that has a product owner title. Uh, somebody who really can make decisions. Uh, you don't want to work with, say, a senior developer who then has to go and ask somebody every time to see if they have permission to even pivot and make changes like that. Um, you need somebody that can actually make the decision. You need them to carve out a week to actually be there, and that can be really hard. But um, you need somebody empowered to be there to actually make the decisions on this stuff. 
So they negative one. Uh, the product owner does have some homework to do, and they need to gather a few things. They need to uh, write down what is the business opportunity. That's only slightly important. <laughs> that might be the key to the whole thing. Uh, we need to know where you're going to make money. Uh, also, uh, what's the market? Who's going to be using this? Who are we trying to solve this problem for? And who's the competition? Uh, a lot of times people think they don't have competition. If your product does not have competition, that's a really bad thing. Uh, I hope you guys know that. If nobody else is trying to solve this problem, you might not be trying to solve the right problem. Uh, ideally, what you want is somebody who's trying to solve the problem and doing it really, really badly. That's the prime market. That's what you want. Um, so we do want to set up our war room. We actually call this a conference room most of the time, but war room sounds way cooler. Uh, you want a place with a whiteboard and lots of markers. Uh, the way we set up ours, our conference rooms are really set up just for these. We've got three rooms with whiteboards, uh, like whiteboard paint on the walls. And the fourth wall is usually glass, so you can kind of use that for another whiteboard too. If you have to use like big wheelie whiteboards, you can do that. Um, but you know, just the more room to write on things, the better. Because at the end of the week, you're going to have walls just full of ideas. So the more room you can have to do that and just write things down wherever you can, that's what you want. Uh, so you want whiteboard markers, you want sticky notes, because uh, sometimes you are going to have ideas that you need to move around, and that's hard to do on a whiteboard. Uh, and then you also want pencils and paper. Lots and lots of pencils and paper. I'll get into that more in a little bit. Um, so that's the necessities. You definitely need those. We also have some things that we like to have, um, especially if you're going to be doing more than one of these, you want to have some of these things. That's Sharpies. Uh, those work really well on the sticky notes. Uh, out on the marker boards, don't do that. The <laughs> circle stickers, and I'll show what those are in a second, but it's like what you would, might use at a garage sale or something like that. Um, and then a timer app on a value and I'll show in a little bit too. But just something that you can uh, time some of these, some of these exercises are timed. Um, so anything that you can use, stopwatch on the phone is fine. Uh, oh, here we go. So this one is one we like to use, it's called Dead Timer. This is actually designed as an exercise app, so you can like time your push-ups or whatever. I don't really exercise, so I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but that's the idea. But it works really, really well for this. So basically, you just say, I want you know five units of 20, or of, uh, like a minute. I want five seconds in between, and we're going to repeat it. And um, that's, that works really, really well for what we're doing. Uh, so good timer that's available on iPhone and Android, I believe. Uh, oh yeah, one more thing that's going to be important too. You need a really big idea. So. You don't want to spend a whole week evaluating whether a drop-down menu is the best user interface for this thing. This works really well for a brand new product, or if you're trying to think about like a big feature that you're trying to put onto your mobile app or whatever, um, something that you really need to tear into and evaluate, that's what you want. Um, so before we get started on the week also, um, you want to schedule about five user interviews. Uh, in my experience, I'd say three on the lower side. Uh, you know, at least three for it to be helpful at all, but also maybe like six or seven on the higher end just because it gets way too much to fit into one day. Uh, five is kind of the sweet spot, so if you can do that, then that's perfect. Um, they tend to run about 30 to 45 minutes each, um, and I recommend about 30 minutes apart. Now that's because the prototyping does go pretty quick, which is good, that's what a prototype should be, uh, but there will be bugs. And there's going to be things that you don't really catch until somebody tries to go through it themselves. And so that gives you a little bit of time in between to be able to fix that stuff. So day one is understand. Um, that's so you can quickly develop context, focus direction, and expose risky knowledge gaps. So in that one, um, it's all about downloading their brain into your brain. So they're going to go over the entire idea from start to finish. Um, some of that is more like pitch practice. Um, so in this one, like I'm sure you guys have all heard of like the elevator pitch, right? So the, the story is if you are in an elevator and, oh my gosh, there's an angel investor in the elevator with you, you've got 30 seconds before they get off the elevator and are sick of you to go through your products and try to get them to invest in your idea. 30 seconds and that's it. If you can't describe your product idea in 30 seconds, then you probably need to think about it some more. Uh, but 30 seconds is not a long time, so that means that you really put some thought into it and you can tear it apart. Um, so we spend about 15 minutes on pitch practice. Some people come prepared for this. Maybe they're looking for investors already. Most people have not. Um, and for some people too, like if it's a new feature or something like that, and maybe it's for their employer and it's uh, not somebody that takes investment, maybe a pitch is not really what they need in the end. But this kind of practice where you can just describe your idea within a minute or two or 30 seconds would be great. Um, then that just proves that they've put some thought behind it. And they're also thinking about the kinds of wording that they want to use. Um, as a designer, that's really helpful for branding and things like that. 
but also just as a way to like focus your attention on what you're trying to solve. Uh, you're looking for certain wording, uh, like simple and effective and things like that. Um, so the next one is review the research. Hopefully they've come with this. In my experience, most of them do not, uh, but it goes way smoother if they do. Um, and we're, so we're looking for that, uh, the market fit, the uh, competition, things like that. Um, yeah, so hopefully you have some analytics. If you've got numbers, it's great. I love numbers. Um, if they've got user stories, they have some real users in mind that they uh, want to use their app. Hopefully they've got a few of those lined up for the user interviews. Um, then these are great. If you have to go through and research that yourself on Monday morning, um, then you can do that. It's just a pain. So if they can do that beforehand, then that's great. So that really brings you up to about lunchtime. Um, after that, you're gonna write your problem statement. So after this, you've got all of this stuff in your head. You should be able to uh, boil everything down to just a sentence or two. It's not gonna be as good as the, the uh, pitch practice, but just something that you can write on a wall. We usually put it on like a big uh, poster size sticking out like this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna write this down, we're gonna stick it on the wall. So all of the other ideas that we're gonna come up with over the week should reflect this. Um, so in this case, this was a uh, like an education app, but this is sort of like your North Star. Everything else that you're trying to solve should fit this, and if it doesn't, then it needs to be tossed out. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and start a back burner board. Um, so this is sort of, it's all of our ideas that are good ideas, uh, but are not going to fit into the prototype on Friday. So uh, hopefully if you guys have done consulting, you'll know Sometimes they've got a lot of good ideas that totally do not need to be done right now. It's not MVP, don't worry about it, they're great, but we're gonna think about it further down the road. You wanna write those down, but put them on the back burner board, um, we'll get to it later, and a lot of times they go there and they die, but that's okay. <laughs> and then the next we're gonna do an assumption board, it looks really similar. Uh, for this, you're going to write down on a sticky note every time somebody says something that may or may not be true, and it's a question that you wanna ask on Friday, uh, for the user's tests, uh, you're going to just write it on a sticky note, put it on the board so we don't have to talk about it yet, we're going to get to it later, uh, but it's an assumption that needs to be answered. And then, at the end of the day, we're going to do our uh, critical path. So, this is where we're going to start getting into disagreements, disagreements are good, we're going to get into a lot more of them in the second day, but really we're just trying to map out what it is that we're talking about. So, maybe this this first piece is they go into Google and they type, you know, whatever the kind of app idea is, and they go to the homepage and they go to this. And, and what is it that they're trying to solve, and what kind of path might they uh, use to go about solving that? Uh, here's an optional one. This one's card sorting. Um, I usually don't do this one myself because it doesn't usually fit in. But uh, this one's great if you have things that where maybe you don't know what the hierarchy of the app might be. Um, you know, especially on like a mobile app, you can only fit in three or four options at the bottom of the nav bar. Um, what needs to be there? What kind of things are we trying to fit in? Maybe we're trying to fit in too much, uh, but this is a way for you to know how things should be organized, uh, what kind of groups can we make to make the interaction simpler, things like that. So day two, diverge. This is where I think we get to have a lot of fun. Uh, I say that as a designer because there's a lot of drawing, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, but first we're gonna practice our pitch again. It takes a while to refine it down. We wanna make sure that this is like a sharp weapon that we can use to uh, make sure that we're trying to get as effective as possible, try to get that thing down to a minute, something like that. Uh, so here's where the drawing starts. And something that I think is, is always really funny, like how many of you guys are developers? Right, maybe don't draw all that much. Somebody when you're like eight years old told you maybe you couldn't draw. The person's a jerk, they're a loser now, don't worry about them. Uh, we're not doing any like portraits or anything like that, we're just drawing boxes and arrows. For some reason people get really intimidated by that, I don't know why you can draw boxes and arrows, it's gonna be okay. This is a safe place. <laughs> so first we're gonna do mind mapping. Um, this one nobody's even gonna see, so I think that's really good for people that are maybe scared of drawing. Um, you're not gonna show this to anybody else, but who's gonna make fun of you. Really what we're just trying to do is, is get some of these problems into a visual format. Can you write it down in a simple way? So by now, Monday, you've got all these ideas swimming around in your head. Tuesday morning, we're gonna try to sit down and refine these a little bit, but we also wanna know what you specifically think. So we've got three, four, six people in this room. Uh, they've all got different ideas, and we wanna hear all of them, because any of them could be valid, right? So this one, we, we just want you to draw it as however you can. It could be mostly words, I don't care. Uh, developers, maybe it's some sort of a database schema you're drawing out, fine, I, I really don't care. This is just practice for 15 minutes to get you used to holding a pencil in your hand if you haven't seen one in a while. 
So the next one is called Crazy Eights. Uh, in fact, sometimes we do Crazy Sixes because eight takes is not nearly enough time. Uh, basically, it's five minutes each. You fold your piece of paper into eight sections, and you uh, draw a different step of the process into one of these eight sections. So it sounds super simple, right? But that's only 45 seconds, and 45 seconds is not a long time to get your idea out on paper. So you've got 45 seconds is like five seconds in between each one. Um, as you can see, they're not very detailed. It's fine. Uh, do not take any notes on them. You do not have time to write. We're just trying to draw some boxes, get the general idea. Uh, after that, we will. Oops, let me go back. After that, we're going to critique. Um, so this is, is where you need to be able to explain your idea. Hopefully, you've got some similar things going on with the other people um, that are doing their story where they're crazy eights also. So you've got some similarities, probably a lot of similarities, but some people that are doing really wacky things. And I love wacky stuff because that's sometimes where the really cool interactions come in. Maybe they're thinking of something way simpler than the rest of you are, and that's really the one you do want to go to. Um, next one is storyboarding. Um, so as you can see, this one's 20 minutes per piece of paper, so much longer. We really get to draw it out. Um, and this is kind of the format we like to use. You put the sticky note on one side of the piece of paper. You write your notes on the other side of the paper. Um, still super simple. Like, as you can see, these are just not even full pages. They're just tiny little interactions. Um, but you're gonna do, the user's going to do this and write that out. They're gonna, then they're going to do this, write that out. And then after that, you're going to do another critique. Um, so this one shows the sticky notes, or the little circle stickers I was talking about. Um, and that's a way for people just to say, you know, when you're doing the silent critique at the end, I like this one, I like this one, this, I want to see this in the prototype, things like that. So you're going to end up with some things that don't get any votes, maybe don't do those. Things that are, have lots of votes, definitely put that one in the prototype, things like that. Uh, and so at the end of day two, uh, probably there's been some crying, it's okay. Uh, and day three, there's going to be a lot more crying, so that's good practice for day three. Um, and Converge, basically, is where we've, we've got all these crazy ideas from Diverge. We've, we're starting to cover the walls of the room. Um, we have lots of different ideas fl flying around, but not all of them are good ideas. That's okay. You need to get the bad ideas out, too. Um, I'm actually a big proponent of drawing out your bad ideas anyway. Um, something I found is that if you're trying to solve a problem, and you have a bad idea, you know it's a bad idea, you still need to get it out. Go ahead and draw it out, otherwise your brain is just going to keep looping in on it. And if you draw it out, then you've got sort of a signpost, like, don't do this. Yes, this was my idea, but don't do this. It's a bad idea. And that's really, really helpful, too. So day three, we're going to start out doing pitch practice again. This is our last day for this, so hopefully it's really, really good. Probably not very different from day two, um, but we're still looking for like our North Star, so we know we're solving the right problem. Um, so then, Wednesday morning, we're spending about an, an hour uh, identifying conflicts. Um, hopefully not conflicts with each other, just conflicts of ideas. So, we've, like I said, we've got a lot of ideas that are trying to solve the same problems, but maybe they're doing it in very different ways. Um, and you're going to need a big one, because you can do both. So, uh, find out what it is exactly you want to do to solve that particular piece of the problem. Um, you know, we're already starting to think about Friday for the user tests also. Um, so that assumption board that I mentioned, where we're going to sort of park all of our questions, uh, we're going to want to take another look at this. Hopefully we've got quite a few. Usually end up with at least 10, maybe 30 to 40 tops. Um, you're not going to be able to answer all of those in the user interviews, so that's okay. So you should probably pick at least 10 to 15 that you know are really good. Um, and you're just going to write all of those out a little differently. So as an assumption, you might say users want a mobile app to plan events with their friends. Um, but with the user test, you might be looking to see if they mention that. Maybe you're going to ask them, how do you do this kind of thing already without this app? Uh, before maybe you even show them what you're working on. Um, so uh, you're looking for some things that are going to be questions. You're just going to have to straight up ask some of them. You're not going to be able to fit everything in the prototype. Especially if you're looking for things like user behavior, things that they're working on already. Uh, that's not going to be in the prototype, so it's okay to ask that. But certain things like uh, small interactions and things that you have some ideas for, you're going to want to write those down just so you can make sure that you're watching for them during the prototype. Uh, so the way we usually write that is an assumption. Just write that as like a statement, not a question. And then you're going to test it with something. Uh, it's usually either prototype or just ask, in my case. Uh, but any way you can think of to get that information out of them, that's great. Uh, and then the third one, validated if dot, dot, dot. So we think this thing is true. We're going to put it through this filter, try to be as scientific as, as possible. And it's true if this happens. 
Um, so after that, we're really going to try to figure out what the prototype is going to look like. Um, this is one that I did a few weeks ago. It doesn't have to be this crazy. This is a particularly crazy one, so I wanted to show it. But um, sometimes what people do is they will take that uh, critical path that I showed earlier, and they'll just have like four or five of them. Maybe there's like five key interactions that you want to test. Maybe that's what your app is all about. You've got these clear uh, like separations of uh, user paths that you're trying to do. Uh, oftentimes, it's much more complicated. And you're just going to map it out. Uh, say that you know this link goes here. Whenever they click on this kind of card, it does this kind of thing. Um, so this is really sort of your your very crude prototype at this point. This is what you're going to try to build. And then one more time before the end of the fourth day, we're going to review the back render board. Got a lot of good ideas on there, some bad ideas. Uh, make sure that the things that you're trying to solve in the prototype um, do not belong in the back order. Back burner, maybe they do. Maybe you're trying to do too much for Friday. That's okay. Um, you want to make sure that it's as simple as possible so you can get those answers that you're looking for. But um, some of these ideas are bad ideas. Maybe some of them need to be thrown away even. Now that you've talked about it more, you definitely don't want to do this thing. That's okay too. And then you want to create a testing plan. So most of the time, the product owner has not done a product design sprint before, and they just need to know what to expect on Friday. Um, some of these people may be their friends and things like that, just need to know what to tell them. So day four uh, is prototyping. Um, this one's a really stressful day for me. Uh, a lot of times this falls more on the designer than a developer, because um, the developer doesn't have really time to build a back end for anything anyway. So you're just trying to be as simple as possible with the prototype. Um, and that means sometimes with the designer staying up really late trying to finish everything, it's usually how it goes. Um, especially if like you're visiting in another city, which happens to me a lot. Um, a lot of our clients in Denver, for whatever reason, are on the coast, uh, as some of you guys are probably used to also. And so you're flying out there and you're staying up late in your hotel room just trying to crank this thing out at 2 a.m. Um, don't do that, <laughs> by the way. I tend to do that, don't do that. Make it as simple as you can. Simple is good, especially when you're just trying to get simple answers out of people. Um, I tend to make my designs on my prototypes look too good, they take too long, and they don't really need to be. Because what we're really asking, or what we're really looking for is this. Prototyping is about asking reality for feedback. So like I mentioned before they came in, the, the design sprint, they thought they knew what they wanted. Uh, they had this idea that they thought was going to be great, but you broke it all down. You asked them lots of questions they probably weren't allowed, that they weren't prepared to answer. They cried. There might be blood. That's OK. Uh, but they hopefully have come out of it having a much stronger product, things that are actually going to do what it is that they're trying to solve. Um, so another thing that we're going to for the prototype day, the product owner doesn't get to skip out entirely on that. Uh, they need you to write some copy and maybe get some data if you need that. I don't often need data, but I do definitely need copy. Uh, the designer doesn't usually have time to, to write the copy also. So anything that the product owner can do on that day is super helpful. Um, so you can do prototypes a few different ways. Um, they can either be clickable images, uh, or they can be static HTML pages. For the static images, um, I like a few different products. One of them is called Marvel. This one's fairly new. Um, so for this one, you just have, here's a screen. You can click on this area of the screen. It takes you to this screen. So it's not an app at all. It's just a lot of images that you can click in between. Um, some people do this in Keynote, even, which I think is pretty clever. Just anything that will let you click an area to get to another <coughs> image. That'll work fine. It doesn't really need to be the, the app. It just needs to kind of look like the app would look. Another one is InVision. Uh, this one might be my favorite, actually. They've been adding tons of features um, that interaction designers really need. Uh, until about six months ago, really nobody was focusing that much on interaction design. Um, so we didn't really have the tools that we needed to do this stuff. Um, there were lots of tools for like graphic design feedback and stuff like that. But interaction designers didn't have uh, some of these things, like InVision just added um, uh, some parts where you can just upload like a, a drop menu image, and you, that will overlay on whatever screen they happen to be on. Whereas before, like if you're if you had a whole screen that had the drop down image on it, but they click on that, the little uh, like drop down further on down, it's going to take them back to that home screen with the drop down image, and that's just awful. Uh, you end up with a lot of questions. And then you have to reassure the user, yes, I know this doesn't work like the real thing. And you have to keep telling that over and over. So anything that we can kind of make it look like the real app, that's going to be great. Uh, here's another one that just came out pretty recently. It's called Principle. Uh, it's only available on Mac. But one thing it does really, really well is uh, animations and transitions and things like that. 
Um, it works really, really well on mobile as well. Um, a lot of times mobile apps have more of that, those kind of interactions anyway. Um, but check that out. Uh, you might notice if you use Sketch, uh, it's laid out a lot like Sketch, which is my favorite thing. It's super simple. Um, and it, it just works exactly how you would expect it to work. Um, so that's a really good one, especially if you're on mobile, check that one out. Um, another one that I like to use is called Ionic. Um, and this one actually does use JavaScript and HTML to be able to build these things. If you haven't checked out Ionic to, for building apps, uh, definitely do that. As JavaScript people, you should be into it. I think somebody gave a talk about it last year. Um, but for prototyping, it works fantastic. There's no way you can build a, like a, a Swift app in one day, but with Ionic you can. And a lot of it comes uh, just pre-built, just drop in a few lines, and all of a sudden you have a list that you can click through and it works exactly like you would expect it to. It works great for prolapse too. Um, some people make the argument that you, know, you, you need better performance than Ionic can give you, and that's totally valid, I understand. I think it does work for a lot of apps, but for prototypes, it's perfect. If you want to use static HTML pages, uh, which I do tend to do most of the time, uh, Middleman's a great one. If you're into Ruby at all, this is a, a great one to check it out. You should be using that one. Another one is, uh, is Jekyll. Uh, it's a little bit older. I don't like it as much, but a lot of people do. That's fine. Um, but a little bit of a shameless plug. I did put together a few kits that are great for prototyping. Because when, you're, when you only have one day to build something, you end up doing a lot of the setup over and over, right? Uh, and we have a few things that we like to use. We like to use Haml. We like to use the, the Bourbon suite for CSS stuff. Um, so I, I put together a few kits that have all that already built in. The only really JavaScript friendly one I have just uses Gulp to compile a lot of things. If you guys have some ideas for a, uh, like a static generator kit that you like to use, and we can put a kit together for that, just let me know, because I'm on the lookout for that. Uh, but the Gulp one does sort of work, and it's good enough. Uh, but I don't like it that much, so if there's something better I can use, I'd like to do that. Uh, but like I mentioned, Bourbon, um, if you haven't seen that before, it's a SAS library of mix-ins and, and extends and things like that. Uh, makes a lot of this much, much faster. Um, it used to do a lot of vendor prefixing for you, but that's not the focus anymore. We're actually taking that out now and using auto prefixer instead, which is great because we don't have to maintain that stuff. But it does have a lot of uh, mix-ins that are very, very helpful for this kind of thing. So day five is user testing. Uh, for this one, uh, Jake Knapp in the blog post said, be wary of feedback that contradicts reaction. Lean in close and watch how people use it before they think. So I think this is really important. This is why Sometimes we'll do remote user testing, but I really want to be in the room. Um, and that's why sometimes they'll actually, they will fly us out to do this in person. Because being there and actually seeing how they're reacting is very, very important. Oftentimes, they'll have a look on their face like they're confused, and they'll finally get it, and they go, oh no, that was easy. No, well, we need to fix that. Um, and another thing that I think is, is really interesting is um, if the client will line up uh, users for testing, it's probably people that they already know. Maybe it's family, maybe it's friends that they've already told the idea to. Um, I don't like that. I want people that have never seen it before that maybe aren't even familiar with the kind of thing this is, but are a good fit for the people who should be using it. Um, and that's because I don't want there to be any bias in there. Uh, if it's a bad idea, I want to know it's a bad idea. In fact, if they start to give me feedback where um, they say that something's confusing or they don't like the wording on something, um, I, I like, I won't tell them that I designed it, I did the prototype, because I want that. Um, and I'll nod and I'll say, yeah, yeah, it's terrible, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, I want to get that stuff out of them because that's the stuff I want to fix. When they say that it's great, I mean, that's a good thing, but it's not super helpful, right? So if, it's, if there are bad parts that we need to fix, I want to fix those. Um, so the interview and observation part, um, it's usually fairly simple. Uh, they just sit in a chair, and you watch them go through it. Um, I like to kick the client out if they'll let me. Uh, if not, I tell them to sit and be quiet. <laughs> you can be mean to the client sometimes. After this, you need to be nice to them, but during this week, you can be mean, so it's fun. Um, so after that happens, uh, you've had four or five people come in, you've gotten their thoughts, uh, your recorder has been taking notes the whole time. Uh, we like to drop those notes directly into Trello. That's really helpful. Um, that way it doesn't end up just lost on somebody's machine. Make sure it's nice in, in a social place. Uh, I should have mentioned earlier too, we use Trello for a lot of this stuff. Um, the mobile app is actually really nice. If, if you take a photo of some of these post-it notes or drawings on the whiteboards, it will upload it straight to the car on Trello and you can forget about it. And it's in a place where everybody can access it and it's awesome. Uh, but after everybody's gone home, so it's probably like three or four in the afternoon on a Friday, you want to go home too. 
Um, just sit down with the client, talk about what you learned. Uh, hopefully you learned some stuff that you weren't expecting. Uh, talk about, go through the assumptions board and really talk with them about how people honestly reacted, uh, what was good, what was bad. Uh, maybe some things need to pivot entirely and that's a good thing too. And then after that, make a plan for going forward. In our case, we're consultants. Uh, hopefully they've hired us to continue on and hopefully that's the next week. If you've done this in an HTML, uh, thing in, in middleman or something like that, or in a Rails app itself, then maybe you just have to keep going with the prototype that you have, and that's your good start to iterate on that. Um, but they need to know just, you know, what's the plan? Uh, we're going to show up on Monday morning and do what? what? What can we use from the prototype? What do we need to build from scratch? Things like that. Uh, so I do have lots and lots of links here for you. Uh, in fact, I'll have uh, a place at the end where you can go on your phone and, and view the slides, but I'll, you'll also be able to see all the links from there. Uh, but I do want to mention that uh, ThoughtBot has written a blog post on the product design sprint. Um, it's a great introduction to this kind of stuff. Uh, it was written by Galen. Um, and uh, really, that's the first place you want to go to read all this stuff. A lot of it's exactly what we've been talking about today, but there's good stuff in there and lots of links, too. Uh, ThoughtBot has put together a design sprint Trello board. And I actually use this as my uh, template when starting a new product design sprint. That's what it's in, uh, intended for. So you guys definitely do the same thing. Um, it splits it up by your pre-sprint prep, uh, and then you've got you know, day one, day two, day three. Everything's in there for you. It has lots of photos, some of the photos I've been showing on here, so you know kind of what you're looking for when you do it, <coughs> um, and lots of links in there as well. Um, the Design Sprint GitHub repo is also super helpful. Uh, in fact, a lot of the stuff in the uh, Trello board just links here, which is good. Uh, so we keep this up to date with everything that we've been learning as we go. If you do design sprints and you see some things that you think should be slightly different, open up a PR. We love those. Um, so here's some links for you. Um, the, these slides um, are on GitHub. Uh, you can view them right here. That's actually what I'm doing right here. Um, the second one is the GitHub repo with those. And that's the one that has all the links. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Joshua Ogle. Follow ThoughtBot too, especially if you're into Ruby and Rails stuff. Uh, we like to talk to people about that. And uh, do you have some time for questions? Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Have you ever attempted to do this with a remote team? Yes. How well would it work? Not as well, but it is possible. Um, yeah, I've, I've done some where you have most of the team in one place and you're not in that place. Um, that's a little weird. Um, we're trying to get better at that because it has been happening more and more. If everybody's in a different place, that actually might make it a little easier because you're just showing things on the Google Hangout or whatever anyway. And uh, that might actually go okay. We've, we've been doing more of that, we're getting better at it. Um, but there are some things, especially like user interviews and things like that, where it is really helpful to be in the same place, if you can. Uh, yes? No, right there. Yes, very <laughs> uh, okay. So you mentioned three roles. Yes. Um, is it normally three people, or is there a difference in the number of people involved? Uh, no, it doesn't need to be three people. Um, I would say you need to have at least three people. Um, I've actually done it with just two people before, just me and the client. Um, that didn't go very well. I didn't like that. Um, especially since what happens is uh, you sit down to, to try to draw different ideas, and you want to argue and find the best idea, but you just end up agreeing, and then the day is really short. <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah, I, that's great. And then you're out of stuff to do for the day. Um, and that's not what you want either. You want people in there to argue. Um, we have had people, I think we've had up to like 10 people in a design sprint, that's entirely too many. Uh, aim for between three and six, I'd say is really good. Yes? Can you uh, just to touch on that a little bit more? Can you speak more on the like the QA process when you're trying to trying to make sure your expectations align with your story properly? Yeah, so uh, on the assumptions board, um, you should write down all the questions that you've had, all the assumptions. Those are usually in question format. But for the testing table, um, we're just looking for, you know, we, we want this thing to be answered, we want this thing to be answered. And then as you go through the, uh, the process, I like to write those down on a Trello card, and then for each person, um, you know, you might have to skip around a little bit. They answered this question here, they made this kind of face here, um, they used this exact wording on this thing. Um, as a designer, I, I really do look for exact words. Um, did they say it was simple or did they say it was easy? Those are different, um, things like that. So uh, as detailed as possible. You're not going to be able to get all your answers, uh, or all of your questions answered. That's okay. Um, but hopefully you've got you know ten core ones, and it's okay if, if they get to the end of it and they didn't even see this section. Guide them to that section. It's all right. 
Um, I do like to give them as little prodding as possible, but um, if, you, if they get to the end of it and they think they're done but they're not done, go ahead and guide them back to it and, and have them do that. Uh, if you're looking for a specific uh, part of the app that they haven't seen, do that, that's fine. Yes? So you put in all this time, you and your team put in all this time this week to do this sprint. Do you ever have clients that just get to the end and say, look, we don't want to move forward, you know, we didn't like this or this, or you guys just weren't liking out? Does that, that happen and what do you, what do you do? I don't think that's happened. It could happen. You guys are that awesome. Yeah, we're at that awesome. <laughs> um, most of the time, they have said, you know, we want you, uh, we want to book you guys for six weeks, eight weeks, um, but you are saying that we really need to do this design sprint in the beginning. I'd say at least 90% of, uh, of the products that we do, um, you know, we suggest a design sprint, they do it. And it's not just because we insist, but they, they really do get a lot out of the process. And hopefully we explain it in a way that they want to sign up for that. But it does make the future development go much, much easier. Um, so we do sometimes have people that are kind of on the fence, whether they want to hire us or if they want to hire somebody else for the development. Maybe they've got somebody else in mind, maybe they're cheaper, I don't know. Uh, but they still want us to do the sprint. And that's fine. That's not a problem at all. <coughs> yes? Do you guys hear anything about BDD? And if so, where do you work at? Uh, I don't believe so. I don't know what that is, but maybe that's because I'm a designer, I don't know. Behavior-driven development. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I'm not as much into that. Uh, I, I think we probably do, but don't call it that. Yes? So you sit people in the chair and you observe them. Do you do, uh, is it all live, like recording of your, uh, you know, validating your assumptions, or do you, you know, record the screen caps and... You know? um, we would like to, uh, but haven't found a really good solution to be able to do that. Um, so we have done screen recording. Um, there's a silverback, I think it's called, where it will record the screen and it will give you like a picture in picture of their face also. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, the problem is where to store that at the end of it. Um, we've talked about maybe like a private YouTube channel or you know, where do you store it where it's not on your machine because by the end of the day if you do screen recordings you've got like 10 gigs of video on your machine and where do you put that? Uh, I don't have a good answer to that, but it is very helpful. Uh, we just try to take really, really good notes during the process. Um, and hopefully those notes are good enough. They usually are. Um, yeah, if anybody has any ideas for where to put those videos, that the client can get to it, and it's not just owned by us, then that would be great. I would like for that solution to exist. Anybody else have any more questions? Okay, great. Uh, well, you can find everything else there. Thanks for coming out.